Hey guys, it's Kevin again, and uh, I wanted to do a video on air compressors and uh, the cover the different styles of compressors that you'll run into as a do it yourself or, or as a home technician. Um, and, and same, you'll run into the same basic designs even in big shops. It may vary a little bit from uh, design to design, but for the most part, uh, I'll show you the basic designs of an air compressor. Uh, I want to show you how they work, um, some troubleshooting tips. Um, how to maintenance them, how to take good care of them, and uh, I'll show you examples of a damaged compressor that uh, was misused, used for the wrong application, and uh, discuss why uh, you should go ahead and, and save up and spend some money when you purchase a compressor versus buying a cheaper one that you believe may work for your application and turns out it just won't. And uh, I'll also cover um, some of the marketing lies that you'll run into when you're shopping for a compressor. That's, that's a huge issue. And, uh, well, for starters, let's start with the, um, the most common compressor that you'll see in a, in a uh, repair shop environment or somebody who uses air on a regular basis. Here at the home shop, I, uh, I have two bays. I do a lot of repair work here. Um, some days I don't do a whole lot, but for the most part, I'm usually running my compressor a couple hours a day. And, uh, and the small compressors just weren't going to cut it. They're, they're nice for taking out on a job site, doing little jobs, filling up pools, filling up tires, changing tires. Simple stuff where you're not going to use a whole lot of air. They're great. Um, for production work or for some real long-term work, they're just not going to do the trick. And, uh, and, a, uh, and buying a small compressor when you need good air, good quality air, is uh, going to make you mad. And, and you're going to be frustrated at it. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go over to the uh, the big compressor here, and I'll show you the different parts and what they do. And and I have one of the pump heads. I had a spare pump head for my compressor. I have it tore down, and I'll show you the different components and uh, what they do and how they work. And then we'll move on to the to, to the cheaper stuff, and and I can show you why they don't hold up. And uh, so let me move you over to the big compressor, and we'll go over the different components and what's going on inside there when you turn the switch on. As you can see, there we go. This here is my 26 gallon, um, says five horse, trust me, it's not. Uh, 26 gallon compressor. This is a, uh, let me move you in a little bit closer. This is what they call a twin cylinder pump, and uh, there's two pistons inside of here that operate 180 off from each other, so that this compressor is continuously bringing air in and compressing it. And uh, your major parts are you have your air filter assembly where the air comes in, and it's filtrated here. On this one, I have actually a uh, expansion uh, box that it quiets the sound down quite a bit. Air's brought in here to the uh, pump head where the valves are. These are common, simple reed valves. That's what you'll find on most. This is a homeowner style compressor. Even though it's one of the nicer, bigger ones, it's still a, a homeowner compressor. This is not a production shop compressor. If I had a, a lot of mechanics working here with me, this would not hold up. Um, the air is brought in through this head, through the valves. The piston draws down. Um, and then when it comes up, it compresses air, pushes the air through the delivery tube and into the compressor. Now, a lot of times I get people ask me what this small copper line is for. This is called the unloader line and there's a switch. The switch here, your control switch, turns the compressor on and off. Also, when the compressor shuts off, opens a valve attached to this line to drain all the residual air pressure that's here. Um, at the bottom of this line is a, and I'll show you one that's out on another compressor, is a one-way check valve. Air can flow down and into the tank, but air from the tank is not allowed to flow back. If it did, this compressor would not pump up. Uh, that's a good hint. If you have one that's running and the valves are good, but it just won't pump up, what you want to do is run it for a little while, shut it off, loosen this line up right here. If air is coming out of this line, 
pretty steady, this one, your one-way check valve is bad, and that's going to cause your problem. So air is allowed to flow down through here, through the one-way check valve, and into the tank. It's not allowed to flow back up. So when the compressor shuts off, this unloader line, a valve opens up, dumps the air charge that's stuck in this line, so that way the, the compressor doesn't have to fight a residual air pressure, and start it much quicker and start bringing your tank back up to pressure. This is what they call a belt drive. As you can see, the electric motor is over here. Um, the red switch is a cutoff, uh, a thermal protection switch like a circuit breaker. If this motor is overstressed, it will pop this breaker. On top of your motor are your uh, start capacitors. They allow the motor to start turning everything because electric motors generate or will consume a lot of current when first starting up. So these uh, allow for what's called inrush current, and these allow the motor to get started at a higher uh, current rate than that your uh, your your 120 line will provide. Back here, you have the belt guard. There's a belt that runs from the pulley on the electric motor to a flywheel on the compressor. And the flywheel, I'll show you on the other one, but the flywheel is actually cut in a way that it it doubles as a fan. It will blow air from the back side all the way through along these cooling fins to cool this assembly down, keep it from getting too hot, and uh, keep this at a, a temperature while it's running. Now you have two gauges. Your first gauge is your tank pressure. This will show you how much pressure your tank is currently under. And then your second gauge is attached to the regular, which in my case is also a water separator. Put down a little bit more. There we go. You can see that there's a water separator. And uh, this gauge here shows me how much pressure I've got my output line set to. And uh, a trick is, most of your tools will not use more than 90 PSI. So what you want to do is you want to turn this down to about 95 to 100 PSI, so that way um, you're not pushing more air through here than you absolutely have to. It'll uh, save you from wasting unnecessary amounts of air and keep wear and tear off your pump. Um, as you can see, this line right here, this is a, get to the side here, this here is the oil drain line, and take this end cap off, I use a rubber hose, right here, and all I do is undo this, slide the hose on, and allow the hose to hang into my drain bucket, drain all the oil out, um, I recommend changing your oil. If you've, if you've got a used one and oil looks really bad, I change it a couple times pretty quick. Change it, let the compressor run for a while, shut it off, change it, let the compressor run for a while, shut off, change it. But if you've been taking good care of a compressor, the oil should last you six months to a year, depending on use. Um, just general thumb, pull your, this one here has a dipstick. You pull your dipstick from time to time and take a look at it. When it starts turning color, you know, uh, starts looking black, change it. It's cheap, only takes 8 ounces. Um, I personally use AMS oil in my compressor because I use it so much I, I, and I often don't think about changing it. So I use the highest quality oil I can find to put in it and that helps with my not probably changing it every time I absolutely should. Okay. Now... Another thing on compressors that you need to note is they have a safety switch. This is called a pop-off valve. This valve is set for 165 PSI. If for some reason that this cutting cutout switch fails and the compressor continues to run and run and run and run long after it should have shut off, it's designed to open up and release excess air before the tank ruptures. The last thing you want is this tank to rupture on you and this thing is holding a lot of kinetic energy that's the reason why air tools work so well there's a lot of kinetic energy behind compressed air and if this tank were to rupture it's like a bomb going off in your bait in your garage your shop in your house wherever this thing happens to be and if you google online and look for image search for uh, exploded compressors exploded compressor tanks it's not pretty I mean these things can kill people now, I've seen, uh, I was on a job site where I was asked to come in and look at a compressor replacement system where the old one had detonated and they also were having the the building and construction guys come in too because they lost an entire wall. It blew 
three quarters of the back wall out when the compressor went out. It was a big 300 gallon unit and when it went off it pretty much just devastated one whole wall of the building. They were really lucky they didn't lose, uh, have more problems. Another thing is, that's the same reason you want to make sure you drain your compressor on a regular basis. Um, you go online and a lot of people say, well, I've never drained mine, or, you know, I've had my compressor 20 years and I've never drained it, and I refuse to drain it, and it's a waste of time, and it's stupid. It's not. People that don't drain them are the ones who are being stupid. Um, what happens is when you, let's say you're in the south here, like I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in Tennessee, uh, during the summer, our humidity is usually 60-70%, which means that 70% uh, humidity means the air has 70% of the humidity it can hold without falling out of suspension and turning into rain. When you hit 100% humidity, you have rain. And 70% is a lot of water in your air. And when you're doing is when you're running compressor, it's sucking air in, it's compressing it down, and it's putting it in the tank, and it's compressing more, it's putting it in the tank, and it keeps doing that and doing that and doing that until it gets to the pressure where it cuts off. And if you had 70% when the air was spread way out, and you cr crushed all that together, that small cubic inch, cubic square meter inch, or whatever you want to measure it by, of air still has 70% of humidity in it. And when you combine all that together, it pushes the humidity inside your tank well over 100%. So guess what? It rains. Even on a dry day, it rains in your tank. And uh, if I could cut my tank open and put a window in there, you'd see it. You'd literally see the air inside the tank start raining. And you'd see water everywhere. That's the way these things work. They produce a lot of water. <clears throat> Big industrial compressors where they're using 500 to 1,000 gallons of, of air. Uh, their tanks... Can generate up to 250 to 300 gallons a day that's 250 gallons of water just from compressing ambient air <laughs> that's just how it works so if anybody tells you oh you don't need to worry about draining it they're full of it drain your tanks if you don't want to mess with draining the tanks go down to uh, a supply store or go online and order an automatic drain system you can get them you can hook them to your compressor it'll drain the tank for you It'll open the drain every time the compressor cuts on. It'll open the drain for a few seconds every time it cuts off. And uh, you won't have to worry about draining your tank. And you won't have to worry about it rusting out and turning your tank into a bomb because that's what happens. The inside of these tanks aren't treated. Most of the time, they're just bare metal. And bare metal loves to rust, especially when it's coated in water, in a lot of water. So water sits in the bottom of the tank and it starts rusting. And it rusts and rusts and rusts till you get a pinhole. One day you hear air coming out of your tank. You look down and you see... A bunch of rust on the bottom of the tank. You can see, uh, you can feel where air is coming out. That's a bad situation. Don't even bother getting it fixed. Most welders that know anything will look at you and go, "No, thank you. That's a liability. We don't want nothing to do with." You weld up that hole and you stress the metal, and guess what? The whole tank lets go next time it comes up to pressure. And then you uh, hear from that guy's widow, saying, "My husband was alive until he fired up his compressor, and now he's in pieces. Now he's dead." And uh, so I do compressor repairs here at the shop too. I've done a lot of them. That's why I'm going to show you some parts and bits and pieces of compressors that have been brought to me. And uh, I won't touch a tank that's leaking due to rust. I'll tell the customer, you know, take all the good components off, throw that thing in the garbage, go find you another tank. Or throw the whole thing away, go scrap it, and go get you a new compressor. It's not worth your life, ever. Um, even if I, you know, if this tank here started leaking like that, I toss this on the gun in a heartbeat. It's not worth it. I'd rather spend, you know, a thousand dollars that I'd have to save up for. I don't have to replace it, than um, weld it up with a welder here I got in the shop, and then run the risk of killing myself or having this thing launch itself into the ceiling and hurting somebody else. So that's the basics of uh, how these things are. We'll go. In, I'll go into more detail in a little bit here when I show you the other uh, the the compressor motor uh, pump I've got apart. But you basically just have electric motor kicks on, spins this belt, the flywheel turns, pushes the pistons up and down, the valves allow air to flow in, and then be pushed back out. There really isn't a whole lot of compressing that actually happens here, it's just the fact that you're constantly pushing air in and constantly pushing air in, it compresses the air in the tank. Um, another thing is, these 
oil filled cast iron compressors like you see here are much quieter than your uh, cheaper direct drive non oil maintenance free compressors these things last longer they work better I'm going to show you why I'm going to show you the pump housing taken apart why they're in better condition and um, they're quieter they're much quieter um, I'll release the air pressure in this one let it cycle on and you'll hear it run it's it's not that loud I like these ones you can have this in the shop with you and you're doing work and it kicks on and if you're listening to music or listening to something else like I usually do while I'm working and you can still hear it you got it turned up loud enough you can hear it over the compressor without a problem uh, everybody you know if you got people over you got a customer over and you're talking about something the compressor kicks on you don't have to stop and wait till it shuts off because the little ones are loud direct drives are amazingly loud like damage hearing levels loud these ones here are pretty quiet and uh, now that I showed you that, let me expl explain what's going on. Like I said, it was a really s short explanation. I'll show you a little bit more when I show you the tour part one. But before I do that, I want to talk about adding another tank. I get that question a lot. Um, should I add a, what's called a surge tank, which a lot of times is the uh, an air compressor where the compressor's been taken off and the tank redesignated for just storage. If you've got a small compressor that doesn't take oil, or you've got a small compressor that's a direct drive, doesn't have a belt, the motor and the compressor housing are one unit, do not use a surge tank. Those compressors are designed to run fast, run hard, and run for short periods of time, and then take long breaks before they have to come back on. Um, they have very poor cooling systems, they have very poor lubrication systems, and they're not designed to run for long periods of time, and that's what's going to happen if you add another tank. Your compressor is going to run for more time at once. No matter what, you're using air, air is air. It doesn't matter if your tank's 9 gallons or 9,000 gallons. In reality, if you use X number of air, your compressor is going to run the exact same amount of time to replace that air. Having a surge tank does not save your compressor runtime at all. It's still going to run the same exact amount of time. When you use air, you have to replace it, period. It doesn't matter how big the storage tank is. It may take longer for you to deplete that air until the pressure comes down enough to kick the compressor on, but the compressor is going to run longer to fill it back up, and the times are going to equal out. The difference is a small, cheap compressor cannot handle running for long periods of time without rest. These ones are a little bit better. This motor on this compressor is rated continuous. The pump is not rated continuous, but it's it's got a, uh, I believe it's like a 3,000 hour pump on it. It's got metal ball bearings. It's got good connecting rods. It's got real pistons. It's got better reed valves, not the best. This one had a, when I got it, I got this one for free because the customer said, oh, it doesn't work anymore. I'm going to throw it out. And I said, well, heck, I'll take it. Tore it apart. It had a bad reed valve. I had in her pump head. Took that pump head apart. Had great reed valves in it. Swapped them out. Compressor worked great. Um, reed valves don't like being run for real long periods of time. These ones are built much better than the cheap ones, but they still don't like it. So I always say on a bigger compressor, if you're going to add a surge tank, don't add a tank size bigger than what you already have. Try to stay to the same exact side or smaller. <clears throat> this is a 26 gallon. My surge tank's a 25 gallon. And I, in fact, I'm going to show you how to plumb your surge tank in. Mine is set up so I can isolate it. So when I don't need that extra air, I'm not depleting it. Um, the reason for adding a surge tank is not to save wear and tear on your pump, like I said. That doesn't work. Your pump's still going to run the same exact amount of time. The reason why you use a surge tank is to cheat on your CFM. Compressors use a designation known as CFM or SCFM. It stands for cubic feet per minute. It's an air supply. And it tells how much air in quantity, not in pressure, but in volume, your pump can supply. Some tools require large amounts of air to be delivered at fast rates. Uh, cutoff wheels, air nibblers, sanders, 
uh, sanding, bla sand blasting cabinets, uh, air blow guns. All those <laughs> use tremendous amounts of air that need to be delivered very fast. Um, this pump is a actually did the comp calculations. This pump is a, a little bit bigger than the original one that came with the compressor. And this pump is actually just shy of 8 CFM, which is pretty good for a home unit. I mean, it's very, very acceptable for a home unit. Um, and uh, for the most part, it keeps up with any tool I have. But there are certain tools that I will use the expansion or the surge tank with that lets me cheat on my CFM. Two tanks supplying air simultaneously um, will allow me to consume a vast quality of air really quick and still allow me to use the tool and then of course once the compressor kicks on I'm gonna to have to wait until everything pumps back up the pressure but it gives me longer run times between the rest times uh, smaller compressor you're gonna get started and it's gonna run out of air really fast and then you're gonna to have to wait a long time and then you gotta wait longer to let the compressor cool down and then you can go back to cutting for a very short period of time and then that cycle starts trust me it gets old really 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 fast so <clears throat> What I did is I added, um, in fact, <laughs> the compressor motor I'm going to show you with a busted connecting rod. This is the tank that it was originally mounted to. The tank was really good. The compressor was junk. So, uh, and what I've done is this was originally where the air came in from the compressor pump. Like you saw in the center of my tank, my compressor. What I've done is replaced it with a gauge so I know exactly how much pressure is in my surge tank. And this was the line coming out originally. I put a, a ball cock valve in here so I can isolate the tank. And then this line comes from my compressor. And this line goes to my hose reel. goes to my feed. So when I'm not using this surge tank, air just flows in through here, makes the 90, and flows on out to the system. If I need the surge tank... I can open the valve up, and now this is part of the system. Now I went from 26 gallons to 51 gallons, because this is a 25 gallon tank. Um, when I don't need it, I just pull that closed. There's that. Another advantage of a surge tank. It solves the it helps you solve the water problem. You saw that my line coming out of my compressor has a water separator. So that means all the air going into the surge tank is mostly dry. Um, still has some water vapor in it. But because that tank is cooler, remember, hot air can hold much more water than cold air. And the air coming out of your compressor is very hot. Uh, compressing air heats it. Compressing anything heats it. Compressing air heats it. So that hot air that's going into the tank, and if I'm using a lot of air that day, there's hot air going into my lines. That hot air is holding a lot of water vapor. The water comes out of suspension and you get air tools that start blowing water everywhere. I see that in a lot of shops I've gone in to look at compressor problems and the mechanic says, man, um, all my impacts are ruined because every time I turn them on and use them during the summer, they're blowing water all over the place and it ruins my impacts fast. Impacts aren't cheap, good ones. Good impacts are three to four hundred bucks. I know I paid, I paid about four hundred a piece for my impacts. Um, they're Ingersoll's, they're top of the line. The last thing I want them is water. Water rusts my impact apart. Don't want that. So I have to go to him and say, look, you got to put dryers in. You've got to do conditioning. You you know, you really need a surge tank to help cool that air down and get the heat out and get the water out so that you have good, clean, dry air. And if you're painting, if you're somebody who paints for a living, water in line is a huge no-no. Water in line will ruin an entire paint job. You could be using the best gun, the best compressor, and you go buy a snap on a 120-gallon quick recovery machine that, that can fast pump up air and uh, if you don't condition the uh, air coming out of the system the first time you make a pass with that spray gun it's going to spray water into your paint and when you get done it's going to look I'll be honest it's going to look like hell and the customer is going to be mad and you're going to be mad or if it's your own car you're going to be even more mad so um, surge tanks good for bigger compressors that are designed for longer run times it's not going to work on your small compressor. If you bought something from Harbor Freight that's an 8-gallon compressor on a direct drive and you add a 30-gallon surge tank, you're going to smoke that compressor. And you're going to smoke it fast. And you're not going to be happy. And you're going to be back down there to buy another one. Or you're going to go down there and cuss them out because you're going to say, oh, your compressor was junk. No, compressor wasn't junk. Compressor was undersized. It, it, it was designed for a specific application. And you abused that. 
So if you're going to do some production work, you're going to do painting at the home, you're going to do a lot of mechanical work at home, or if you just want something you don't have to worry about. That's something that, you know, I've got a lot of customers that bought big compressors that don't really need them, but they didn't want to think around with the small ones. They didn't want to worry about it, so they bought a good one. And they said, oh, I bought this, and I know I can keep it pretty much forever, and I won't have to worry about it. And that's the secret. Let's go look over here on the table. I'm going to bring a pump over, and I'll show you what's inside one. Alrighty, well, give me a minute here, and I bring the pump over, and we will take a look inside of a compressor. All right, what we have here is a disassembled compressor pump. Um, I'm planning on buying the, the rebuild kit. I'm going to rebuild this pump so I have a spare just in case. You never know. And uh, since both these pumps are identical and they're good quality pumps, they're Campbell Hossfield cast iron pumps. They're made in the United States. Um, they're made with real bearings and real materials, and they're going to last a lot longer than the cheaper one. So let's look at the different components. All right, first thing we have is the head. This is the air inlet side. This is the side going out to your tank. As you can see, the, the inlet side comes in. There's no baffles in this unit. Um, it's liquid cooled, or I mean oil cooled and air cooled, but it's, it's got the ability for oil to keep it cool. So a lot of compressor manufacturers will put a lot of baffles here to quiet them down, or try to quiet them down. And also to cool the air. This one doesn't really need any more than the outside fins. Um, as you can see, it's a thick aluminum. It's well constructed. Um, but that is what's called the compressor head. Next we have the valve plate. Now if you notice, the reed valve is missing. That's because this reed valve is in my compressor. My compressor when I got it, the reason why the guy got rid of it is because the reed valve broke. That should be one continuous valve that goes all the way across. What happens is, this is the intake side and as the piston moves down air is drawn through by a vacuum and comes through it's hard to see there you go it pushes down on this reed incoming air is is at more pressure than the air inside the cylinder when the piston moves down and that's what happens as the piston moves down there's more volume no air to fill it so the outside pressure is heavy enough to push these valves open it forces itself down into the cylinder where the piston is. When the piston moves up where this valve would have been, it pushes that reed valve up and allows air to come out and go into the tank. Now when the piston's moving up, this valve can't push it up because it's blocked up here. And when the piston's moving down, uh, this valve only moves up, doesn't move down, so it blocks off here. That's how it works. Piston moves down, this valve opens, this valve is shut, allows air in. When the piston moves up, this valve is shut, this valve is open, pushes air out. It's a really simple setup. And uh, reed valves aren't the best. They really aren't. Uh, your really high quality industrial compressors are going to use real heavier duty metal valves. But for a homeowner unit, if you got a quality reed valve and a quality valve plate, it usually works. The reason the valve plate and that compressor broke is because the guy I got it from had it cranked way up, had it cranked up to like 160 pounds. You don't want to do that. Um, there's no need to have that much pressure. Um, he thought more pressure meant more power, meant better work. Actually, it's it just plays hell on the compressor. It's not designed to run that much. It's not designed to pressurize air beyond a certain point, and it wears a lot of components out fast. In fact, the first thing I do, that compressor is supposed to be set at 135. I turn it down to 110. I don't 
need 135 pounds. My tools work at 90. And uh, if I got something that's giving me a hard time, I'll walk over, crank the compressor up long enough to give it the extra oomph. Or use the surge tank. It gives me more air. It gives me the same thing. And uh, it saves wear and tear on my compressor. It shuts off quicker. Pump doesn't run as much. The less that pump is running, the less the parts are wearing out. All right. Let's go back down here again. Now the next part is jugs and pistons. Pistons travel up and down the side. It's called a jug, just like a motorcycle or a marine two-stroke engine. You have a jug assembly. This one's actually still in really good shape. Um, I'm going to have a machine shop lightly home this while I do the rebuild. But uh, And as you can see, it's very thick wall, very heavily constructed. I mean, these things, this is not built by amateurs. This is not a Chinese built compressor. This is what happens when you still get stuff built inside the United States. We build it pretty solid. This thing's designed to run for a very long time. Next we have the pistons. As you can see, hey, they get you over here a little bit better. They look just like car pistons. There's uh, two compression rings that seal off the cylinder, provide compression. There is an oil control ring, just like in your car, that keeps the oil from traveling up and being compressed. In fact, these rings are a little war, as you can see, there's cooked in oil on top of these pistons. And further down in here, you have your connecting rods, just like in a car piston. And they just slide over the crankshaft as the flywheel turns. Pistons move up and down. At each end, I don't know if you can see this. At each end is a real roller bearing. There's one here. There's another one in the front behind this plate. And uh, when I do the rebuild, it'll have new bearings, new rings. Don't need to do the pistons. I'll clean them really well. And uh, new valve plate. And lightly home the cylinder walls inside the jugs. And that will pretty much make for a brand new pump. And uh, I'll probably end up swapping this for my other one and then rebuild the other one. And then I'll have two brand new pumps. One on the compressor, one as a backup. And I'll be good no matter what. Okay, and that is a better quality compressor. I won't say that is a best quality compressor, because trust me, there are compressors out there to make mine look like crap. I mean, there's some awesome rotary compressors and, and oddball compressors that do amazing things, and compressors designed to run continuously all day long, and all they do is add air when needed, and the motors never shut down. And those are for huge industrial plants, but those also cost a lot. <laughs> But, you often get people who say, I don't need that good of a compressor. I need something for occasional use. What should I get? And the next down is considered a direct drive, which means the motor, and you saw mine had a belt. There's a belt goes through there. A direct drive means the motor and the compressor pump are bolted directly together. That's why it's called a direct drive. And you can get them oiled or oil-less. I recommend oiled because they're quieter. Not by a whole lot, but they're a little bit quieter. They last a little bit longer. They cool a little bit better, which means they can run for a little bit longer before the, they overheat and have an issue. But I'll bring one over. This is an oil filled direct draft compressor. It's a cheapie, but it works really good for. I take it out on job sites where I only need to do light work, um, change tires, air tires up, um, brake jobs, really easy stuff. The same components that you saw on the big one uh, two gauges. One shows tank pressure, this one shows regulator pressure. They have a safety valve. At the bottom is a drain to drain the water out. And these things will, you know, it's only 8 gallons, but trust me, if this thing ruptures suddenly, 
full of air, it can still kill, even though it's small. If you're standing right next to it, it, it can do damage. It has the head. Underneath the head is a valve plate. There's the jug. And then the crankcase. And this one, as you can see, has a, a window, which you look at the oil level through. This is where you add it. This one, of course, doesn't have a dipstick because it's got the window. But it does have these breather valves. All these compressors have breather valves that go in here, and you've got to make sure they're good. If they get blocked up, they can cause you running issues. You should be able to, when your compressor's running, feel little puffs of air coming out of the top. That's normal. That means it's working. There's a screw down here to drain the oil out. This one only takes about two or three ounces of oil. It's a little bit quieter than a, a true direct drive, but it's nowhere near as quiet as the big one because it's just how it works. You know, the when you bolt them together, the motor and the pump are mounted together. They're both trying to share cooling flow, and they both generate a ton of noise, especially when they're mounted in this manner. All right. Now let me go over to the bin, and I'll show you what a true direct drive, well, what it used to look like. This one is uh, busted up pretty bad, and I'll show you what happened and, and why it's gone bad. Let's bring it back up. All right, be right back. This is normally what you find when you go into a parts store or into Lowe's or Home Depot and look for a compressor. This is a true direct drive. Motor and pump are permanently mounted together. There used to be a piston at the top of this connecting rod. It's long gone. Uh, this was running way too long, way too hot. You can see where it busted the jug. This is the jug. You can see how thin and cheap that is. And uh, this is supposed to be the fan, what's left of it. That would try to cool the, both the motor and pump down. It uses a standard bearing down here, not a roller bearing like you saw in the big one. And uh, let me go find the head for it. I'll show you the valves in it. This is the valve plate. Same basic setup as the big one. It's just you can tell these are much cheaper built, much less dirty. In fact, these were bent when it came apart, showing that it had been run too long, got too hot, and, and warped the valves inside of it. This is the compressor head. These are the baffles I was talking about earlier that he used on the cheaper ones to try to quiet down and cool them down quicker. And a little crap air filter. I just went in there like that and this is that one way valve I was telling you about allows air to flow in will not allow it to flow back and then it has the port for the unloader valve to take the air pressure out when you go to Lowe's and you buy you a uh, $200 25 gallon compressor that's the motor you get, and this motor is not designed to run for long periods of time. It's designed to run, pump the compressor up, and it should be at least resting at least two to three times longer than it's running. That's the rule of thumb on duty cycle on these kind of compressors. If it runs for four minutes to fill the tank up, it needs to be off at least three times that. It needs to be off for 12 minutes before it runs again. So a lot of times what you're going to have to do is air the compressor up and go smoke a cigarette if you smoke if not go drink your soda go talk to your old lady or your kids or something and then come back and run it and as soon as it kicks on walk away again for another 15 minutes and then come back use it when it kicks on again walk away for another 15 minutes and now you can see why in a shop setting that's not going to work it take you forever to get a job done you slide under get two bolts out and have to go take a 15 minute break 
a job that should take you one to two hours is going to take you five to six hours if you do it using the compressor properly. So these, what's going to happen is you'll start out doing that. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to take good care of this. And then after the second job, you're like, ah, I can't really hurt. Go ahead and kick it back on again. And next thing you know, that's what you're left with. And you're down to the store again, spending our 400 bucks on something that you're going to blow apart again. So if you ever do any real work, these things just aren't going to cut it, man. It's just not going to work. It's just, it's going to make you mad. You're going to be frustrated. You know, it doesn't matter. This one's made in Taiwan. It doesn't matter where it's made. If it's this kind of cheap, quickly assembled, low quality parts, low cost parts, it's not going to do what you want. If you buy a cheap compressor, I bought that little Harbor Freight one. I know what it was. I know what I bought it for. I take it on a job site and I use it the way I know it needs to be used. And I take care of it. Um, is it my first choice? God, no. The big thing is my first choice. I just got that one, but it replaced another big compressor like that I had here before. It was an old Campbell Hossfield. It was given to me, was given me a long time ago. And it was a used compressor from a farm where the guy took really good care of it. And it lasted a long time. He had it for years and years and years. And then I had it for years and years and years. And finally the motor actually went bad. The electric motor just seized up. And when I priced a new electric motor, I said, ah. And then this guy said, here's one that doesn't work quite right. I took it apart and I was like, this is easy to fix. So I'm back in the business. I didn't have to spend hardly any money at all. But, you know. If I would, I would have had to gone downtown. I would have had to save and buy a quality compressor because I know that these things just don't work. They don't hold up. And that's the way it works, man. Uh, in this business, if you're going to use air tools, you're going to use quality air tools, or you're going to use... Um, and the thing is, once you have air, it opens up a whole new world of stuff you can do. It makes your jobs shorter easier quicker you'll start wanting to buy really cool stuff that uh, works better and and some of their tools are neat I'm gonna show you something it's called an airlift it's an amazing device it uh, you basically basically you end up hooking air to it. As you can see, there's an air fitting on it, right? Here. You hook air to it, and using the Venturi effect, it draws a vacuum on the cooling system. You know, those really hard to fill cooling systems, because you always have air left over. It takes forever to bleed the air out, drives you crazy. You got no heat until you get up to a certain RPM, and you hear this gurgling noise all through your vehicle because there's air trapped in the cooling system. This does away with that. It lets you fill the cooling system completely full, first time. No need to bleed. No need to go back and recheck. Every time, first time, completely full, no air. This requires a good compressor. It requires a big compressor. It has a good CFM rating. You hook this up to one of those tiny little, like that little Harbor Freight thing on the floor. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. That thing's going to run nonstop trying to keep up with the tool, and the tool's not going to get enough air, and it's not going to be able to draw the vacuum, and you're just going to be mad, and, and you're going to be frustrated. And I've seen it a million times. People go buy a compressor and then they go compressor crazy and they go, I gotta buy every air tool there is. And then they call me and they go, oh, My cutoff wheel doesn't work right. My sanders don't work right. And I go, What kind of compressor you got? Ah, oh, I got this little thing I bought at a cheap little place and it's it's a 10 gallon compressor, a direct drive. And I go, Yeah, those tools weren't designed for that. And that compressor wasn't even closely designed for what you're doing. You gotta have a real setup or it's just gonna make you mad. It's gonna drive you insane. And that's basically it. I mean, I'm hoping that maybe you got something out of this. Maybe not. Uh, uh, it just is what it is. If you want high-quality compressor that will do what you need it to do, if you're going to do some real work, you got to have something good. If you're going to start painting cars at your property or you're going to open up a body shop or a repair shop, you got to go with a good compressor. If, if this shop had more, you know, this is two bays. It's just me. That's it. I have no technicians. Um, I owned a shop in town where I've had a couple technicians. I managed a larger shop in town 
where I usually had three or four technicians at a time. I've been at bigger shops. I've been at shops that had six or seven technicians where I was managing them. And in those shops, my compressor would be a joke. It would not work. If you have a lot of guys using air at one time, you got to have a big compressor. Got to. There's just no way around it. Um, there's, Like I said, there's no way around it. Yeah, I see all kinds of videos here on YouTube that where the guys say, "Oh, you can cheat by Jay Z chaining a bunch of compressors together." That works if you're gonna if you're gonna paint one car, you're gonna paint your car, and you want to learn how to paint a car. Yeah, you can do that. If you can get a bunch of guys that got a bunch of compressors, you can daisy chain them all together, and they will put out enough CFM usually to feed a uh, what's called a uh, HVLP gun, which stands for high volume, low pressure, which means they only use about 50 pounds of pressure, but they use tremendous amounts of uh, CFM. And here, here comes the here comes the part that really sucks. The manufacturers lie; they lie their heads off at you. Um, you can see it right see that that says two horsepower eight gallons yeah it's eight gallons I believe that I believe it all day is that motor two horsepower god no not even close what that means is that means when that motor first engages at the first time while it's using the inrush capacitors to get cranking, the motor can max output two horsepower worth of torque when it first starts up. Once it's running, it's not two horses anymore. And it won't even come close to two horses again. In reality, that motor, if I sat down and did the math, knowing the amperage load and the voltage and all that, you know, just using the Ohm's law, I'm going to promise you, by the time I'm done with the different formulas, it's going to come up to a quarter horse. I've done it before on these small engines, you know. Mine over in the corner says five horse. Is it a five horse? No, absolutely not. Um, a lot of times they lie in the CFM rating. They'll use something called SCFM, which is, um, depending on who you talk to, it could stand for standard cubic feet per minute or scheduled two feet, cubic feet per minute. It's basically a way of lying, changing the numbers that trick you into thinking the compressor can put out more than it actually can. And that's just the way it works. So if you're looking for a good compressor, go overkill. You know, that construction guy, this, this compressor was used on a construction site. The guy unwisely went to a regular home repair shop or a home repair supply store. Lowe's, Home Depot, you know, they're all, you know, I'm going to say they're all the same, but they all usually carry about the same style of products. And he told me, he said, look, I've got crews of men out there working on houses using air guns and air nailers and all this stuff. What do I need? And the guy sold him that. He sold him that for like 500 bucks. He told him that was what you needed. It's low maintenance. It doesn't take oil. He told him it's perfect for a job site. It doesn't take oil doesn't take oil means contaminants all get into the system. There's, there's only a plastic shroud down here, guys. Dust and dirt from the grab site goes right up in here. Gets that all up. The piston rings on that, I wish the piston was still there. It was lost today. It exploded on the job site. The piston on those things is usually just a flat plate. With the connecting rod attached, they don't even pivot. The connect, usually it just goes like this. And at the end of the fat plate is a fat Teflon ring. That's it. That's what they call a piston. This works great for short periods of time with long periods of rest. Running it nonstop, smoke that thing. It's not designed that way. That guy at the home repair shop should have got his butt kicked for selling my customer that thing for a job site. He should have sold them at least something like that. So if you guys are looking for a compressor used on a job site, unless it's one dude, and, and then you can get away with something like a pancake per compressor. They're great for nail guns. But if you got like five or six guys all using nail guns or floor screws or any of that kind of stuff, you know, um, all at a time, not going to happen. The small ones just ain't going to cut it. You can't save money by skimping on your compressor. 
in the long run you'll just spend money and more money and you'll keep spending money and you'll think it's a fluke and you go back and buy another one of those hunks of crap and it'll blow up and you buy another one and it'll blow up I always tell people if you really want to get serious on doing what you're doing and you seriously need air go big buy the biggest and best compressor you can get your hands on and if the biggest and best compressor you can get your hands on is something too small wait longer you know, eventually that motor on my compressor it can be wired for 110 or 220. I'm going to run a 220 system out here because I'm going to a much bigger welder next year, and I'm going to wire wire that motor to run on 220. It'll use less amps, which means it'll save electricity, and it'll be much more efficient and it'll run quicker. And it'll it'll do worlds of good. If you can and you can afford it, you got 220. Go with the 220 compressor any day of the week. You can get big big pumps on a 220 you can get twin stage pumps where the first piston pumps to a pressure and then the second piston compresses it even further and those are called quick take ups they can pump from from empty to full in no time flat I mean I can't argue with that one it's three minutes and ten seconds from completely empty to 110 pounds and shut off that's good that works for me I'm one guy though I've had a bunch of guys I'd have a twin stage 240 volt big tank compressor and I wouldn't even try to make something like that work. It would just make me and my technicians mad. That's the last thing I want. Okay guys, I hope this helped with something. Um, I think the only thing I, I meant to talk about and I didn't think to talk about when it comes to surge tanks is there is a mythos kind of goes around about that. People will tell you to add a surge tank because it'll save your compressor from running. It doesn't. The compressor, like I was saying earlier, the compressor runs the same amount of time no matter what. It's just on a twin tank system, it'll run longer. So don't add an R tank thinking it'll help your little compressor out. It won't. It'll actually stress it. And that poor little thing is only supposed to run for a few minutes, maybe two minutes, and shut off and then cool down for at least ten minutes. That poor little thing is going to run for like ten minutes and it's going to go up and smoke or it's going to what it'll likely do is break a reed valve that's the first thing it'll do and you'll take it apart and put new reed valves in it then you'll do it again and next time it won't break a reed valve next time it'll, it'll that teflon ring will go completely gone and then it's junk or it'll do like this one did throw a rod and send the piston and everything flying across the construction yard punch a big hole in the side of the compressor Wish I'd been there. That'd been interesting. He said it was a big chunk of hole and pieces of metal went everywhere. And what they had done is they wired that one to a bunch of tanks and put a bunch of guys on it. And he said that compressor had been running for like 15, 20 minutes straight when finally it just went kabang. And it was done. So size your compressor to your job. You don't need a big compressor if you're just doing tires or inflating pool things. Go with a small one. Now I will say one thing. I see this a lot. A lot of people ask me about blowing out sprinkler lines. What kind of compressor do I need for doing that? And the answer is, not a compressor most of us can afford. The sprinkler systems require humongous amounts of volume. The best way to do that is just look through the yellow pages, call around, and go online, look on the internet, find out who will winterize your sprinkler systems for you. We can get them done here locally for about a hundred bucks. 100 bucks a year, the guy brings out a compressor, it's on wheels towed behind the truck, it's got a huge uh, four-cylinder gas engine, they fire up, and it's got a humongous rotary compressor that can put out amazing amounts of CFM, I think, I think the one I've seen, I've worked on a couple of big ones, and I think they're putting out 75 to 80 CFM, that's a lot of air, mine only puts out 8, they put out 80 that's what you want when you blow out sprinkler lines. These little compressors won't cut it. They just won't do the job. And it's not worth the expense of buying one because it's going to cost you thousands of dollars when you just pay somebody 100 bucks a year to do it for you. Even if it's 200 bucks a year, it's still a deal. A home compressor is just not going to do that. So if you had questions about that, that's there's no other way around it. you got to go with a big compressor. I want to thank you guys for watching the video. I know it was kind of short. I really wanted to get into more stuff, but 
and basically just be repeating myself over and over again. There's really not much more you can go about it.